my name's Tim Campbell, board advisor to Humanic. We've got a fantastic interview lined up with someone who's not only going to talk about maybe the Middle East, but also how he learned Mandarin. We've got Onat Kibadogu, who's going to speak to us all about his business enterprises. Onat, thank you so much for coming along. Thanks for having me. Brilliant. Um, I don't know how you find the time. You're everywhere. Where have you just come back from? Singapore. Uh, I was having my graduation. I was just showing my parents around as well. Oh, fantastic. Congratulations, by Thanks the way. Thanks so much. So, for, for our viewers, talk to us about your career history today. What have you been up to? Right. Um, well, I just finished my master's. Mm -hmm. So after and that, and what was that in? Um, Southeast Asian studies. Okay. So I wanted to focus on Southeast Asia, which I believe was um, a bit underrated, mm -hmm. um, even though it's quite important, getting even more important by the year. Um, well, I came around all that area. Um, firstly, in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. when I, you know, that was when I was introduced to Asia. Mm -hmm. um, during my bachelor's years, I was studying business, and then I just wanted to see how China was like. Yeah. It was just trendy for quite a amount of years. So Cantonese or Mandarin? Um, I didn't start learning Mandarin back then. Um, it is, it's, they speak Cantonese in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. um, and English just brings you around everywhere. So. I was a bit lazy with the language, but um, then I realized I should have just, you know, um, made a more big of an effort to, you know, get to know the culture. Mm -hmm, and the mm -hmm. best way to do that was to um, learn the language. Mm -hmm. um, so I was lucky enough to get a scholarship from the Chinese government after graduating. Um, and then I went to Shanghai. Oh, that's, awesome. um, that's where I started to learn Mandarin. And uh, I met a lot of great people. Mm -hmm. um, Shanghai is a place where you could just network like on a rally. Um, it's so fast, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, London, Paris, these are all comparable. But I would say Shanghai, is, there's much less barriers, especially as a foreigner. Um, you just, you know, you just, you know, go straight to the top mm. quite easily. Mm. Um, so that was an opportunity which I think I, you know, uh, I made the best of. Um, I met one of my business partners there, mm -hmm. David Wood, um, from Germany. Yep. Um, we were working on a number of projects with him. Mm -hmm. um, and then in, in Shanghai, I kind of realized the Chinese market and the Chinese, um, anything about China was getting a bit saturated. Yeah. Um, I mean, China has been interesting for almost more than 20 years. Correct. Um, it's been opening up for more than 30 years. And um, so I kind of wanted to see where the opportunities lie. And I was lucky enough, to, uh, actually, a good friend of mine, when I was studying in Paris, um, he was from Singapore. He mm. just called me over. He was like, you know, why don't you come down and see Singapore? And I was like, yeah, sure. Why not? Because I had the time when I was studying Mandarin. That was one of the great opportunities because um, I didn't have a fixed schedule mm -hmm. I had to stick to. Uh, so I just went down to Singapore and I was completely impressed. And I started to learn more about Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. um, and I saw that it was... China almost in the 1990s. Yes. So I was like, right, this is this is this the, is the next one. Yeah, this is the excitement I was looking for. So that's how I ended up in Singapore. And, and t t what what are some of the projects that you were involved in in terms of while you were exploring? What did you see which was exciting? Right. Um, I mean, it's, it's just um, it really matters what is key for you, what excites you. There you could just find anything you want yeah. in Asia, and you can find it in big amounts. You yeah. can find it. You can find the big shots, whoever mm. you want to meet. So I'm, I'm very um, passionate about, I think, I would say two things. One is education, mm -hmm. and the other would be communication. Okay. And I think they're very interrelated. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I try to get involved in things that kind of interlinks them, and people who believe in that as well. Mm. Um, that's how we, I think, um, got more, in, more involved with um, Richtopia, mm -hmm. with Darin. Um, it's, it's a platform where, as you would say, you know, it's like a lighthouse, right? Yes. So it kind of shows you the way. We don't really want to tell you what to do, mm -hmm. but we kind of show you the opportunities. We, we show you uh, what's out there and that knowledge you can just use to improve yourself, improve the world as well. Um, that's one area that I was uh, involved in terms of communication. The other was I was lucky enough to um, start working with this um, quite nice um, public affairs and public relations firm. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, they're just very, very, um, the, the culture there is very uh, positive. Yep. It's a place that I can learn. Mm -hmm. uh, and how did you get introduced to the company? I just sent them my CV, actually. <laughs> As you do. <laughs> I see, you've got to go. Um, it's just that they were very receptive uh, in every way. Uh, very nice people. It's just, um, I think I would divide my endeavors in like uh, there's certain places I 
I would say I'm, I'm, I'm the one who's teaching and there's certain places I'm the ones who are learning. Mm. So I'm the one who's learning. So I would say that's the place that I've been learning very fast in a very short amount of time. Um, in another way that I'm interested in education as well, basically that's kind of the key underlying reason that um, I've been you know, interested in doing a PhD. I want to um, kind of open up a new space in Southeast Asia where uh, we look more into the future mm -hmm. because it has a very difficult um, history yeah. and, it and I think it has a very, very bright future. And the way to do that is to focus more on tech, um, technology, and how that can leapfrog the society, mm. uh, not just very you know, small pockets of it, but the society in large um, into the next level. Mm. And I think we're, we're starting to see that. Um, and it's very, it's very exciting to, to read about it, get involved with it. Yeah. Um, so that's where my PhD focus is. And there's this other project I'm starting to get involved with. Um, it's not, um, I mean, it's, it's up and coming. Um, with my friend, um, David, who I met in Shanghai. Yeah. Um, we're working on a project where um, we call it the diary. So diary is, well, quite simply a letter notebook. Um, and it's just, it will be sold online. But the whole interesting story behind it is that um, one, it will be produced in a very sustainable way, um, and it will be, um, it will have elements from Vietnam. Um, and in Vietnam, we would have, uh, we have a, a partner educational facility now where um, deaf children are um, being taught English. And wow. they're and quite, they're very good at it. Wow. Um, they actually had an uh, exam recently, um, 10 of them had it, and they all passed. Congratulations. Um, so we want to get that number much bigger. Yeah. I don't think 10 is enough. We want to go into the thousands um, as much as we can. Um, and the way we're doing that is that um, a, a significant amount of the proceedings from the notebook will go um, to the um, institution. Yeah. And it's just, I would say, it's very encouraging to see even small amounts of money um, can make huge impacts. Yes. I mean, let me just tell you, like 500 pounds. Yeah could get you um, a year's tuition Wow! Uh, for 10 kids in Vietnam. For 10 children? Yeah. So, I mean, we, we, with David, we have this vision of, you know, we don't want to just come to the age where, you know, we're 50, 60, you know, and say, okay, you know, we, we had this wealth and we had this great life, let's, you know, give back to the society. That's also, you know, very respectable. Mm. But um, I would say, why not just start now? Okay. Um, let's just you know um, give back as, as soon as possible, and mm. you know maybe even inspire others to do so. Um, so, would you describe yourself as a social entrepreneur? In that case, yeah. Um, it's, that's not really like uh, a title we strive for, but um, end of the day, it seems so. And um, we're just happy to have a business model that is um, focused all, definitely on profit making, but a lot of the profit will go, mm. um, I think, for a very good cause. So there's a number of businesses, the likes of Todd's and Shoes and right. others who have been very successful right. growing their brands essentially by being focused on giving back in some way, shape or form. Are you trying to create a number of brands or are you trying to highlight the the lack of support that some of these individuals might have in countries? What's the focus on? Um, I would say it's just we want to show how easy uh, it is to give back yeah. and have a huge impact. Um, you don't have to have millions to give back. You don't have to have a huge uh, multinational enterprise to give back. You can have a simple business model, um, a simple notebook uh, for uh, a certain price, and then th that could make a huge impact mm -hmm. on hundreds of kids in Vietnam, which will be the next generation of Southeast Asia. Uh, we could just in just expand that same business model in every way. We just that's how we started, and you know who knows where we end up. Fantastic. And is that because you, let's be clear, you you you're incredibly well educated. Um, you're not bad looking. You could go into a number of companies in the commercial world, couldn't right. you? And take a number of different directions, which would be the normal route for most people right. who have uh, a, a, a Western education. <laughs> um, so, so why are you choosing this one? What, what what's driving you to do that? Um, that's what gets me up in the morning. I mean, I um, I tried the corporate sphere. To be honest, um, I worked in the best companies of the automotive industry. 
uh, it just didn't excite me um, mm -hmm. as much as this kind of uh, endeavors. Um, I didn't feel like I had a purpose in life. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel like I was having an impact on society. I just had a job mm -hmm. which anyone else could do. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that's how I want to come to this world and leave it. Um, I want to have a story where I could say, well, you know, this probably couldn't have been done by anyone else. And I inspired these people mm -hmm. to do so as well. And I'm not saying I'm doing anything difficult. It's just a bit more, you know, getting creative and meeting great people, mm -hmm. getting inspired, people like Darren, mm -hmm. people like David, who mm -hmm. are very vis great visionaries, mm -hmm. who open up your mind and mm -hmm. also open up your network. Mm -hmm. And, you know, having that, you know, go-getter spirit and, you know, saying, why not, let's just do it. Uh, and um, that kind of excitement is much more fulfilling for me. Oh, fantastic. And you, you talked about a number of projects that you're right. involved in, so that's only one. Right. What else is taking up the, the limited time that you have, but you seem to be spreading it everywhere? <laughs> well, I also write for the Global Times yep. in China. They're, um, I would say, arguably the most prominent newspaper they have there. Yeah. Um, it's quite, it makes a lot of noise sometimes. Um, it's very, it has a very, I would say, like a direct attitude. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's a privilege to write for them. Um, I don't really write any, anything very controversial, mm -hmm. but I noticed that whatever I write um, is getting re read by the um, right people. Um, I heard Xi Jinping, yes. the chairman himself, yeah. um, reading Global Times Daily. Mm. Um, and I noticed that China has this very solution-oriented uh, um, approach mm -hmm. to whatever issue they have societally. I mean, they have a lot of issues, mm -hmm. but they go after them. And when you point them out, that's why that's um, basically what I'm doing. Yeah. I'm saying that you know everything is fine, but see, you know, there's this problem. Mm -hmm. And I, I see that at least some measures are getting taken. I'm not saying that I'm influencing their policies, no, but no. it's just that um, it's very. Uh, the way they want to organize that newspaper is that bring foreigners who have a vision for China and point the, point out um, whatever problems they have yep. and then work on them. Yep. So I'm just very you know privileged to be a part of that group. So for, for our, our viewers, what are some of the, the issues that you've highlighted? Um, it could be anything. I would say one of the key issues uh, was soft power, I would yep. say. Um, China has a lot of, um, it has a lot of cash, mm -hmm. it has a lot of um, hard force, but I would say it's lacking a lot in terms of um, getting to your mind and your heart. Yeah. Um, you don't really dream of getting a Chinese brand. Yeah. You don't really dream of watching a Chinese movie. None of us have a favorite Chinese football player. Mm -hmm. um, these are things that make, say, the United States the United Kingdom, yeah. very powerful in a lot of ways. Yeah. They touch people's hearts and minds, yeah. and these are uh, how you can influence the world uh, without using sheer force. And I would say I was, in a lot of articles, I'm trying to point this out, and there's ways of doing this. There's, mm -hmm. um, it's just that they, what they have to realize is that it has to um, come from the society itself, yeah. and it cannot be just self-imposed from the, um, the government by saying, oh, okay, let's just um, hire this many reporters and tell China, tell about China to all these people yeah. and then expect people to uh, know a lot about China. Yeah. It just doesn't work out like that. You got, you got to have, say, a hit movie. You got to have a great song. You got to have a you know football player where people will be... Ambassadors. Yeah, or, or definitely. Vehicles, ambassador yeah. is the word. And um, so then people will see, well, China isn't just factories and a lot of people. <laughs> because even to this day, in the July of 2017, you mm -hmm. just go out to the street and ask people what comes to their mind about China. And I've done this. Yeah. They say, oh, a lot of people, um, factories, um, uh, pollution, and yeah. so on. Which is okay, part of the story. Very interesting, yeah. But um, that's not what you know. What comes to mind when you say, "Well, how about you know France or Italy or even Turkey?" Mm. Um, you have a lot of different, diverse ideas about these countries because mm. they have their own soft power in their own ways. And I believe for a country like China, which is going to be like the most powerful economic power in a decade or so, um, is it, this most also very, um, very disproportionate to its own physical power. Yes. So that's one key issue I'm trying to highlight. Mm. And is, is that something that you'd also take around the rest of South Asia, would you say that's Definitely. a necessary process, process as well? Yeah. Um, I would say even though, for example, uh, compared to a small size, I would say Singapore has a greater um, soft power because when you when you listen to someone from mm. Singapore, when you, uh, when I, you know, claim that I have a master's degree from Singapore, the reception I get is much different. Um, it's just, and that is important when you want to influence 
um, global affairs, mm -hmm. um, trustworthiness, and that brand image, having a having a brand around your country, your yep. your um, whole identity is very very important. No, so, so with, with regards to education, be the focus of what you want to take forward. Looking around Western education, right. is there things that you're trying to lift from the Western education mm. system and and place into self? Right. You say, or, or is there a unique process that you're trying to develop locally? Um, that's a great question. It's just that um, I haven't really seen anything beyond the Western mm -hmm. education mm -hmm. because I was brought up in a, I was first, the first school I went was in California mm -hmm. and then um, I studied in an international school with a lot of international friends, yeah. completely Western um, curriculum. Yep. Um, I'd done the IB program. And um, I done, um, and when I went to the university again, completely American based. So what I know of education is that, yeah. Uh, quite, even though I'm real, I realize that that is not the whole story. Mm -hmm. But so what I appreciate appreciate in that system is that the way, especially a lot of if it's if it's the good quality one, where I would say IB is a great example. Mm -hmm. It doesn't just show you. Um, what to learn, but how to learn it, yes. and how to seek the opportunities, and how to um, think beyond the box, and in, in an interdisciplinary manner. Mm -hmm. Because you cannot just be good at maths. No. You have to understand something about music as well. You have to understand something about theater. You have to understand um, at least the basics of science as well, and so on. Um, because, um, it, for example, it's not history, for example. It's mm. not uh, uh, like an area of its own is right now, is yesterday, is tomorrow, mm -hmm. um, and it, it involves all kinds of disciplines. So you cannot just say, well, I, don't, I have nothing to do with that. Um, that has to be something that at least you have some literacy on. Yes. Um, it, I mean, you have to understand history to understand even blockchain, because you cannot just go into, um, into the blockchain area and say, oh, it's going to just blow up the whole world, you know, it's going to change everything and this mm -hmm. and that. I think. Um, Mr. Raymond Fry was very clear about this in the last interview. Mm. You have to look at the history as well to see where it's all going and how it fits within our own society. That ha that gives you a much more realistic way of understanding. Uh, and you have to understand how psychology works. You have to understand how sociology works mm. to understand even the very most financial looking thing. As, it's all interne blockchain. interconnected, isn't it? Always. Yeah. Um, you, you raise around the, the conversation around blockchain and technology. Um, having seen quite uh, rural, rural areas and obviously some of the institutions have been incredibly advanced as well, how is technology impacting the lives of people in, in Vietnam, for right. example, or somewhere? And is there, is there enough happening in those environments around the potential? Um, let me give you an example from China. This is mm. a very clear example, I would say. In China, there are um, Alibaba villages, yes. what they say. Yeah. Um, people who completely depend on selling stuff on Alibaba, yep. could be anything. Um, that's how you leapfrog from, you know, having just a very simple shop on the street where in the middle of nowhere mm -hmm. to being a global business. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, you, you can do it in a 24 hour. Correct. Um, around, like, it's just quite impressive. Um, in, I think in Indonesia, in Vietnam, and I would say the Philippines, mm -hmm. those are the three countries I think to watch for in the Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. um, in that region. Um, you have companies which might look like, say, a sharing economy company, which could be, um, let's say, um, a rate right hailing company. Yeah. But it goes into payments, and then payments, and that kind of translates into financial inclusion. Mm -hmm. Hence, you see startups which came out as a, tech, a very you know a known tech company. It's not like a very novel idea to have a right hailing company right now, but that transforms itself using its user base um, into a uh, company which enables people to have a uh, means of finance. Mm. So that's uh, happening in Indonesia. I'm seeing that happen in um, the Viet uh, Vietnam area as well. Um, in terms of, ex uh, for example, having a diverse um, service sector, for example, yeah. is very key because in that way you can kind of rapidly go through the steps of, uh, well, how a country develops is very kind of basic. You go uh, through efficient means of agriculture, yep. and then you industrialize, and yep. then you go into the service sector. So, I mean, that could take 300 years, that could take 30 years, and all these um, technologies just makes that, uh, they just make it much more shorter. And um, it, it means, for example, someone can have a shop, 
and also be a um, right hailing right, uh, driver. Yeah. And yeah. having that kind of means was just not non-existent like 10 years ago. Correct. So, so that's one way um, tra tech is transforming Southeast Asia, but that's just a very simple way. And I would say the peak uh, and like let's say the uh, the top player in the area is Singapore because it has this very promising, I would say, um, model of bringing the government, mm. um, the corporates, and universities together in a very effective way. They're they're using the um, the mutual human resources of all of them, the financial resources of all of them, and they churn out quite good results. Um, they have institutions, they have think tanks, they have um, industrial um, sites yep. where they are expanding the um, the vision of industry 4.0 um, they're not just you know applying something where they get from the west but they're mm. actually creating themselves Self as well. I think that's really interesting because from our perspective at humanic we are definitely seeing the collaboration between educational facilities uh, governments and tech companies who are providing goods and services for all of those coming together to empower the people of right. the area. And that's the, the, the holy triangle almost. Right. Yeah. And it's great that that's being replicated in different areas. From the, the, the conversations that you're having, are, are many of the tech entrepreneurs socially minded like mm. you are? Or is it all about, particularly when you're talking about blockchain, it's about let's get as much money as mm. we possibly can? I think, well, let's put it this way. The ones who will have much more of an impact will be the ones who will um, have society in their minds. I would and why say. do you think that's the case? Um, because it's, well, if, if you want to change the world, um, you have to um, see it in a broad sense, not only in a way that, you know, saying, oh, I will impact this many people, but yeah. also I will um, provide them with a new way of, um, well, just basically a new way of living mm -hmm. where um, they're financially included um, within the whole system. Mm -hmm. um, they are they are much more uh, hopeful about the future, which impacts politics as well. Yeah. Um, and quite basically, they are um, empowered through very simple means of technology. So you have to have technology that is not um, excluded to uh, you know a small group of financiers and all that. Mm. But you know because there you can make some money for a, you know, a few people. But and then, but no one will really remember your name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, if you really want to have an impact, and you know, just think of the technologies that um, come to mind when you when you say, oh, you know, they impacted the society. They're always the ones who changed people's lives. Yeah. Um, that could be Facebook. That could be Alibaba. Yeah. That could be um, Uber. Yeah. So those are great examples, and they were never made for a very, um, ex even though maybe their own. Um, original story could be in another way, but mm. they were never meant to be uh, exclusive technology, even though maybe that was an easier way to make money. Mm. The scale around, that's a very interesting The scale issue. matters, I mean, yeah. the scale is just, um, that's how technology makes history, mm -hmm. and that's how um, you impact the society, um, not only by saying, okay, let's change very, you know, let's tweak these things and regulation and government, and uh, you know, just appeal to a group of um, bankers and all mm, that. Mm, mm. I mean, history requires you to go down to the society and change their lives as well. Well, I'm waiting to see your place in history is coming. I can feel it because you, you, you talk so eloquently about not the cliche passion, but more so purpose right. around a direction of travel you want to take and the impact that you want to leave on people. And not in a um, an arrogant way, but more so, it's almost like it's what you're supposed to do. One of the other things you talk about, though, is financial inclusion. Right. Why is that so important? Um, well, it's, it's almost like a hygiene factor. Um, you cannot develop a society without having a bank account on, you know, having a uh, credit card or anything uh, in people's wallets. Uh, you need people to, first of all, buy something, to mm -hmm. have commerce. Do you need mm -hmm. commerce to um, grow? You need, mm -hmm. you need um, and then hence, you will have people pouring in their um, cash from abroad, mm -hmm. hence creating educational opportunities, hence creating um, industrial opportunities and so on. Mm -hmm. A very key way of growing is, especially for Southeast Asia, yeah. is foreign direct investment. And to, to attract that is to have a, a base, a society who is well-educated. That's why I think um, I pointed out those three countries. Philippines, because, Vietnam, yeah, Vietnam. because um, they have 
a society where, for example, in the Philippines, you really don't need a local language. You can mm. just go around with English. Yep. It's a very well-educated society compared to... Manila is amazing. Yeah, 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 compared yeah. to its own region. And that's where I see the potential. Again, in Vietnam, you have a similar society. Um, in Indonesia, again, you have this mindset of um, going out and int having international um, presence. Mm. Um, and hence, you, um, for all this to happen, you got to first have um, commerce. Yeah. Commerce is what drives um, any kind of progress um, because you cannot have you cannot have technology no. without if, if you cannot sell something it's not innovation that's how that's even the key um, definition of innovation because I can invent something you know I can just tell you oh Tim you know I, I invented this um, um, infinite energy mm, something mm. and you'll be like well great but how much is it and if I cannot just somehow sell you that it's not innovation. Yeah. It's just something I just came up. It's an idea. But if it's uh, if it's uh, even a very basic thing, but if it makes my life better, that's a perfect innovation. Well, Lona, if you have that, just slip it under the table. We'll do something <laughs> afterwards. <yeah? laughs> but I suppose, so the, the thing for me now is around what's next for you. What, what's 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 the plans? Because you've got so many different opportunities, and you're. Right. You're in so many different places. Um, you've just qualified. You've made your parents happy. So that's always <laughs> a good start. What's the what's the, the focus for the next couple of years? I was, I want to learn and meet a lot of um, people. I want to learn from them in the venture capital business in Southeast Asia. Um, I want to see how startups will impact um, the the leapfrogging process of that um, whole area. Mm -hmm. um, I think Singapore is a great place to do that. Um, I find startups as more impactful than just you know having simple the you know the what, what would you call it? like the CRM and yeah, all, yeah. The, all these um, process of yeah. you know uh, multinational enterprises just giving back here and there. I think having startups focused on transforming the society and being able to fund them, being able to give them the resources they need is a very key issue that I think. Um, a lot of Southeast Asian nations are aware of, mm -hmm. and I'm very happy, happy to see that. I'm, I'm seeing that um, Singapore is creating funds, um, Thailand is creating funds, uh, Indonesia is creating a lot of funds where um, they're empowering a lot of quite simple startups. You don't have to come up with a new Facebook, but mm -hmm. you could just have a simple startup which is making maybe a neighborhood better, mm -hmm. so on and so forth, you will have a better region. No, I love we, we, we've we done tours in and around Ghana, for example, right. and you've got little businesses like a, a, a gentleman's created a new way to create charcoal out of coconut shells, for example. And his big barrier is getting access to, to growth capital, right. where the interest rates are so yeah. extraordinarily high, he can't find an aid to buy a bigger facility. And we hear where people can get those loans on their credit cards, you, right, you kind you of, think. it's just so amazing. So yeah. your, your point around why the financial inclusion and also the education under that is so important is, is really powerful. It, it's been amazing, but I know our viewers are going to want to con connect with you in some way. They're going to bombard you. How is the best way for them to connect with you? Um, just anyway, it's fine. I'm not uh, formal about anything. Mm -hmm. um, you can, they can find me on LinkedIn. Good. Um, that's the easy way and so on and so forth. That's Fantastic. Easy. Well, once you've done your celebrations uh, <laughs> and popping the champagnes and throwing the hats in the air around graduating, I'm sure you'll be getting lots of things. Honor, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you. Thank, Thank you, you so much for your time. Good to meet you. Thank you.